All right, excellent, everything is working. So I'm gonna talk today about getting started with ECS. My name is Kate Huddleston, I'm a software engineer at a startup called Shift. We are a marketplace for buying and selling used cars, uh, but what's probably more relevant is that I used to have a startup that was a platform for helping engineering teams deploy service-oriented infrastructure. Uh, so I have used containers a lot, uh, built tools on top of them, uh, and worked with AWS quite a bit, and also researched a lot of the tools that exist in the space. So again, my name is Kate Heddleston. You're always welcome to tweet at me at Heddle317. If you get bored during this talk, you can find everything you never wanted to know about me at kateheddleston.com. And what we're gonna cover today is kind of four basic topics. The first is, what is ECS? Uh, why would you choose ECS? How does it work? And then what are the gotchas? So, jumping right in, what is ECS? ECS stands for Elastic Container Service, although I sometimes get the acronyms wrong, so you should probably double check that. Um, Elastic Container Service is basically Amazon's solution to orchestrating containers. So, how many of you have heard of Kubernetes? How many of you are interested in learning more about Kubernetes? That's, Kubernetes is my favorite tool because it's the most loved tool that most people have not figured out how to implement. Um, but ECS is actually AWS's kind of counterpart to that. Um, and things have come a long way since AWS started building ECS, but it, it basically has kind of these five major components. The first is that it has task definitions. So if you wanna run a container, the first thing you need to do is you need to define it. And tasks are actually running containers. A service is a series of long running containers, so it could be one or more containers, and this is kind of where the orchestration starts to come into play. A service is an encapsulation that uh, AWS can use to say, hey, I'm gonna run these containers on these different instances, we're gonna run this many of them, um, et cetera. Uh, a container instance is really just an EC2 instance that has the ECS daemon running on it, and then a cluster is a grouping of uh, container instances that can run many tasks across all of them. So this is a, a very sophisticated diagram of what it might look like. So you have an ECS cluster, and each of those purple boxes is an instance. So it's an EC2 instance. Again, uh, AWS will add the ECS uh, daemon on it so that it can actually integrate with ECS, but it's really under the hood, you set them up just like an EC2 instance. Um, tasks will run uh, on top of the container instances, and then a grouping of tasks, and I made them separate colors. Um, theoretically, those, the different colors of tasks could be different services. Uh, different services might need a different number of tasks. Uh, they can talk to each other, they could not. Uh, you could have um, a container running Nginx, you could have a container running Memcache, you could have a container running uh, your own version of Redis if you don't want to do hosted Redis, and then you could have a container running your application code. If you wanted to break your application into smaller services, then each one of those smaller services could also be encapsulated in a container, which is pretty much synonymous with a task. A container, a running container is a task. Uh, one of the other nice things about ECS is that it integrates seamlessly with everything else in the AWS ecosystem. So you can use elastic load balancers to point to your ECS cluster. You can use the elastic container registry to store your Docker images. And all of these things can work really nicely with each other. So uh, VPCs, security groups, kind of if you've used EC2 and a lot of the AWS services, those things also all apply. So ECS clusters run inside of virtual private clouds. Uh, they use security groups. So all of the permissionings that you would, you either have or will come to know and love if you use AWS are all completely relevant in ECS. So a big question is why would you choose ECS? Um, there's a, quite a few options out there in the world of uh, infrastructure management. There are so many ways that you can build and deploy applications that it's actually really overwhelming. Um, ECS is kind of the big one that AWS built a few years ago. Kubernetes is the most well known. But basically if you've got a bunch of containers and you are breaking your application into microservices, the next thing you're gonna to need to do is you're gonna to need to manage all of those containers at scale. And that is why orchestration is probably the biggest challenge of service-oriented infrastructures and, and microservices. And if you like the history of DevOps like I do, um, back when DevOps was starting out in 2004, 2005, it was kind of like this 
period, we were like, we can make infrastructure code. And everyone got really excited and started automating infrastructure and you had tools like uh, Chef and Puppet come out where suddenly, you know, we have cloud computing, we have virtual machines, but you can have Chef and Puppet go out, configure these machines, install all of the files you need, and you can do things significantly more programmatically than you could before. Uh, we are now in the infrastructure as a service era, as I call it, so things are even more compartmentalized. Um, you can get your VMs from AWS, you can call things through APIs, and now we have containers, which are this virtualization layer on top of everything, and you can you can break your applications into these really modular pieces. Um, you no longer actually need to write Chef or Puppet scripts that go out to a server, run a whole bunch of things, could potentially error on a box. You don't know if all your boxes are the same. Now we're like, oh, let's build containers. And we can put these containers on the different boxes. Uh, and we can make sure that all of the containers are exactly the same because we build this image beforehand and we pull down the image and then we run it. So. The, the bigger problem now for everyone is you might have hundreds, if not thousands, of microservices at your organization. Uh, and I know I talk to people across like a lot of different tech companies, um, and some of the big companies, there's a two or three to one ratio of services to engineers. So they might have 500 engineers, and they might have 12 to 1,500 microservices. So suddenly managing your infrastructure's orchestration is a huge challenge. So ECS does this inside of AWS. This was kind of the, the first thing that AWS built to say like, hey, we're gonna tackle this orchestration problem. But at the same time, Google started bringing something that they used internally into an open source tool uh, that is Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is kind of this, one of the biggest open source projects. I think, I don't know if it's still true, but it was the most contributed to open source project uh, for a while. Um, so, the reason that you might use ECS is that ECS is a natural evolution on top of AWS. So if you are already using AWS, you're already using EC2 instances, you've got your VMs configured, you know your security groups, you have all of this code using AWS's API, then adding ECS to manage your containers and your services is gonna be a pretty natural add-on. It's gonna take you not a lot of time to implement, the APIs are the same, um, you're gonna completely understand how ECS works. So that's really nice. The disadvantages are that ECS is proprietary to Amazon and you can't use it anywhere else. Kubernetes, the reason that people are so excited about it is you can use Kubernetes anywhere. So Kubernetes is a, a very big project. It is a very fully featured orchestration tool. It is also very complicated. And the reason I joke that it's everyone's favorite tool that they have, have not successfully stood up is that it actually takes a lot of work to stand up a Kubernetes cluster uh, and to de start deploying applications in production with Kubernetes, but if you do that, you get a lot of power, because you can use it on any cloud, you can use it uh, internally, so if you have a private cloud, you can use Kubernetes, um, and it's really well supported in the community, which is why uh, AWS now has EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service, so if you would like to run Kubernetes in AWS, you can also do that. But to try to keep up with Kubernetes, uh, Amazon has added on Fargate. Fargate Basically, with ECS, if you have a bunch of instances, you still have to manage the auto-scaling. You have to create the instances. You have to manage auto-scaling policies if you want to add more instances or take away instances that aren't being used. Um, Fargate is an abstraction on top of that that basically means you don't have to manage those things. AWS will manage them for you. Um, and that's something that Kubernetes is slightly more powerful than ECS at at managing instances and resources, and uh, they have pretty robust auto-scaling policies, and so Fargate is kind of like the serverless elastic container service layer on top of ECS. And then you can also still use any classic tool like Chef or Puppet, and you can use Terraform with ECS, we do at my company, so if you wanna know more about those, if I'm like just throwing a lot of words at you and you wanna know more about them, you can come uh, ask afterwards. And then a little bit about containers versus VMs, because I just had this question. Um, if you have been using and building VMs for a long time as the, as the way that you have been deploying your infrastructure, it can be a little confusing about what containers are for. So VMs are an abstraction at the hardware level, so you can create a virtual machine, you can have the, an operating system inside of that. Containers are a layer above, so they're an abstraction at the operating system level, so you get a virtual kernel which means that you can package different things inside of containers than what you would have historically packaged inside of virtual machines. 
So if you're building everything into a VM, you can, you're gonna get a lot of complexity and you're gonna be adding a lot of things into that VM. Um, if you separate out everything into containers, so like if you have a bunch of microservices, let's say you have five um, microservices that run your application, you might have, um, well, we'll just do three. Let's say you have Nginx, you have your application code and you have a memcache uh, service running. So you've got three different things. If you're building them into a VM, you can start to get a lot of complexity in how you're building your VMs. Containers will do one thing at a time really well. So you can package each one of those pieces into a container. You can mix and match them on boxes. Uh, developers can manage just the containers that are relevant to the services that they work on. Uh, and the, the way that containers are built is pretty seamless with the development process. So you can manage your Docker files really easily. You can see everything that's installed. Uh, so it just gives you that higher level of abstraction to separate out containers and kind of the pieces of your application from the underlying infrastructure and hardware uh, level things that you have to build. Okay, so more specifically, how does ECS work? And we're gonna go through kind of five, well, we're gonna go through four steps, but if you were actually building this with a real computer, you would do number five, which is confirm everything is working. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you some of the code and how easy it is to work with the ECS API. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create an ECS cluster with just one instance. We're gonna create a task definition. We're then gonna create an uh, elastic load balancer and a target group to associate with the ECS service. And then finally, we're gonna create a service that runs the task definition. And then finally, we'll confirm everything is working. So if you were to actually get started, and there's some great online tutorials that I will reference at the end of this, if you go to get started online with ECS, you're gonna be going through these steps um, pretty closely. So the first thing is you're going to create an ECS cluster. And if you remember, an ECS cluster is a conceptual grouping of EC2 instances. So we don't have the EC2 instance yet, we just have the cluster, but you're going to connect, I use Python a lot, um, so this is all Python code, but you're gonna connect to AWS using Boto3, um, you're gonna pick a region just like you always do, um, specify the service, and then you uh, do ECS client, create cluster, and you just give it a name and that's it. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna create an EC2 instance. So if you have done a lot with EC2 instances in AWS, this will look pretty familiar to you. You're going to give it an image ID. So if you build base images, you can still use any base image that you want from here. So I don't know how many of you do that as a practice with AWS, but still works with ECS. Um, you can set the instance type, the instance size. There's a laundry list of configurations that you can set on an EC2 instance that I won't go into here, but you can set all of them. And then finally, you set the user data to point to the ECS cluster. Next up, we have a container definition or a task definition. The task definitions, I mean, they basically, pretty much everything is JSON these days. But you give it a name, you name the task, you can link it to other services running. So in this case, I think I have an example where you wanna run Nginx and you wanna run WordPress. It's two separate containers, two separate tasks. So Nginx is the reverse proxy, it's what will accept traffic and route it to WordPress, and then WordPress is a content management system that's just gonna run. So the image, so you name it, but the image is actually Nginx, and so for a lot of open source products, there are already images that exist that you can just pull down with Docker. So Nginx, Redis, I mean, any, like you name it. Um, they already are creating Docker images that you have free access to. So WordPress has one as well, which is really great. Uh, port mappings, so if we have uh, Nginx running, it's our reverse, reverse proxy, it's gonna be running on port 80. Uh, and the container port and the host port are gonna be the same because the host port is it's, it's just gonna be the same. Sometimes they're different. Most of the time with Docker, you're gonna have the same ports, uh, unless you have some sort of port collision. And then you can specify memory, you can specify C CPU. And then with that task definition, you're going to register, or with that container definition, you're gonna register it as a ta task definition with AWS. So you just give it the container definition, you can give it a family, which for some reason in this example I named Hello World, but you can name it whatever you want or whatever family you want. Uh, 
And then finally, you're gonna create a service. And so if you remember, a service is a set of long-running tasks. So the, in this case, we are gonna to point to our cluster name, we're gonna give it a server name, we're gonna give it a task, and we're gonna give it a desired count, how many of this task do we want running at any time? And ECS is gonna make sure, like if we want three, uh, if we want three of this running at any time, it's going to make sure that if we take away an instance, there will still be three running. So if a container gets killed, it will restart another container to make sure that we always have three. So that's kind of the orchestration level work that's happening that we don't have to do manually. And then you can specify things like deployment configuration. And then at this point, uh, we would actually have a service running, we'd have one service running one container on one instance, which is not very exciting, but if you wanna specify more, you can add more instances, you can add more tasks, you can add more services. So basically you can scale this up as much as you want. Um, and at this point you would verify that it was working. So you would just go check on your tasks that are running. You would actually probably, we ran Nginx, but we probably need to create a task definition for WordPress because our Nginx is linked to WordPress. So we would want to create a task definition for that, create a service for that, run that service. It would probably run in the same instance, but if we wanted more instances, we could add them. If we wanted our instances to auto scale, at that point we'd have to go do auto scaling groups. Um, or if you don't want to do that, you can use Fargate. And that is pretty much what you do to run ECS. So there are some more configuration details depending on what you want to run, but as far as ECS is concerned, the API is actually really simple, and it builds off of a lot of the things that already exist in AWS. So, given that this seems like a relatively simple thing to use, what are the gotchas? Like, what are things that people who have been running this in production for a long time are like, yeah, this is really frustrating, or this is a problem, or this is something that I would fix? So the first one is service discovery. Service discovery with microservices is just a huge problem in general. How do services know about each other? Um, how are services exposed, especially if you have a lot of internal services? So you might have a lot of services that are only exposed to other services within that kind of private IP space. Um, a lot of people in AWS use elastic load balancers for this. So if you have elastic load balancers, then you can change out the clusters behind the load balancers, and so you can have services talking to the load balancer versus trying to talk to specific servers or specific clusters. And so you can kind of use the ELBs as your main endpoint for different services. And you can have internal load balancers, so load balancers that do not face the public web, and you can also have load balancers that face the public web. So you can do both. Um, but service discovery is still hard, and I would say this is one of the things that Kubernetes uh, has more built-in support for that ECS does not. Uh, the second gotcha is if you do use elastic load balancers, health checks can be really troublesome. So elastic load balancers, when you put an instance behind that load balancer, you'll specify a health check endpoint, and that health check endpoint needs to return a 200, or whatever response code you say it needs to return, in order for the load balancer to say, hey, this, in this instance is registered and I'm gonna send it traffic. Um, that kind of checking can take a long, it can take a, quite a while in AWS and sometimes if you know, there's an issue, it can take a while for an instance to be registered. So that one um, can still be kind of tricky. They have added a lot more functionality to health checks though, so AWS released kind of like ELV V2s not too long ago, and they are much more robust in how they do health checks, and you can specify a lot more parameters around how long you want it to pull for, what you want the failure rates to be, so that you don't have like minutes where you could have instances that are not registering with ELBs because of some weird issue. Uh, the third one is just managing instances, which I mentioned, so if you want to run a bunch of containers on a bunch of instances, you're gonna need to create a bunch of instances. Um, and this also kind of bleeds into auto-scaling policies. Really, when you think about it, most of the time you want more instances when you have more traffic, and then you want to get rid of them when you have less. And auto-scaling has long been known to be like a fairly difficult thing with AWS. They give you a lot of functionality and a lot of power, but knowing what your auto-scaling policies are can be really challenging. The, uh, someone once told me, up is, up is easy, down is hard. So getting more instances is easy, Figuring out when to get rid of them is hard, 
Um, this is kind of what Fargate does with AWS. They added Fargate on basically because so many people are having challenges managing instances, managing auto-scaling policies. Uh, so that is why that's still there. Another challenge is, so if you're running a container, right, when you build these containers, you don't build in secret information. You don't build in passwords. You don't build in really anything um, that is private that shouldn't be in there. So at some point, you're going to need to load in secret configurations. And there are a couple solutions for this, but I think Amazon has now a hosted, I can't remember what it's called, like a vault solution where you can store secret configurations and you can give ECS access to that. There are also other third-party tools that will help manage kind of secret configuration. So this, you know, it includes AWS access keys, anything like that, uh, that you need to have under lock and key. The last three challenges are kind of just generally true if you're running a lot of microservices. So if you are doing rolling deploys, you could have multiple code versions. So let's say you're running a bunch of containers in ECS, you've made an update, to your code and you want to change out the container that's running your application code for a new container that's running the latest application code. Um, how you do that deploy can still be really challenging. So you could either go and update each server one at a time uh, and have uh, ECS does that for you. Um, I don't know if they support blue-green deploys, but really what you want to do is you want to stand up a second version, fail over your traffic, and then if it's not working, fail it back over and shut it down. Uh, but this is still kind of something that's being solved and ECS has support for, but doesn't completely solve for you. Um, and then finally, organizing your services and your system can still be too complex. This is true, but those are human problems. So I'm not sure that anyone's gonna be able to build a technology that uh, stops people from building things that are too complex in the near future. But basically, you can have a thousand microservices. And if you have a thousand microservices, it's gonna be hard to know where they are and what they're doing and who manages them. Um, and you could have what Kelsey Hightower, who's a developer evangelist for um, Kubernetes, calls a distributed monolith, which is one of my favorite words. Basically, it's the idea that you had one monolithic set of code and you were like, let's break this into services because that will make it much easier to manage. And so people do, but they have these separate services that are actually tightly coupled and still all talking to the same database. So you might have some advantages because you separated them out, but really what you have is called a distributed monolith. And that, that has challenges because if one service fails, it's likely that many services will fail. So they're not truly decoupled. Um, and that is still gonna be true even if you use containers and even if you use ECS. Okay, that is all I have for you today. So here are some resources of people who have written very eloquently on these topics. Um, a gentle introduction to ECS will walk you through actually getting started with ECS. The seven biggest challenges with ECS is written by the Convox team. Convox is a deployments tool and they use ECS pretty aggressively. So they, uh, they have like a very thorough write-up of the issues that you run into. Um, kind of ECS task definitions, AWS has amazing documentation. And then finally, for anyone who is looking to get started with containers, if you are trying to figure out like what is Docker, how do I use it in production, um, Alice Gold, Goldfuss just gave a great talk this year on containers. So she has been running containers in production at GitHub for many years, and she gave like just a fantastic overview of what are containers, why would you run them in production. And then the person who's not on here, but if you wanna learn about Kubernetes specifically, Kelsey Hightower is the person to go look for online. He's a developer evangelist for them, and he has put together so many great talks on how Kubernetes works, why you would use it, um, how you can get started with it, all those different things. So that's all I have. If you uh, want to ask questions, you're welcome to. We have a few minutes for that. Otherwise, uh, you're welcome to come talk to me afterwards. Thank you so much.